But the important thing is that out of this very long uh, relationship and actual presence of the Ottomans in, in Europe, there is a certain image that is still with us. Um, in a way that is interpreted correctly, in a way that is also, uh, there are uh, uh, exaggerations and not so well informed interpretations of it. So I would like to bring a perspective to that with respect to uh, how uh, historically and uh, as a state and even before that as a, uh, as a frontier principality, the, uh, the Ottomans related to uh, Europe and also uh, bring to your attention, I think, uh, rather a uh, significant aspect of it. Uh, with regard to how the Ottomans themselves felt at the beginning, at the zenith of the classical period of the Ottoman Empire, what did they think they were? Uh, what is the identity of the state that was cultivated at that time? And then uh, the changes with the decline and ultimately the demise of the Ottoman Empire. I mean, the very first Ottomans that came uh, across the Dardanelles had a different notion. They did not have a global notion, but certainly the empire had a global notion. And uh, some of this, I hope, will uh, be of interest. Uh, a point that is not very much discussed and um, and uh, uh, studied uh, it almost anywhere I know. The, the very first, um, how did the Ottomans themselves uh, get there? Who are the Ottomans? I mean, um, let me just bring uh, some clarity into that. And when you say Turk, um, you know, there is the Karasi in the Arctic there, um, uh, the uh, northern, north of Europe, not the uh, Arctic. Uh, uh, well, Karasi is a Turkish word. You go across Asia, which I will say something about it uh, in uh, this afternoon. There are all these Turkish words there. So um, there is a nomadic background. There is a nomadic background that spreads. And like many others, um, like the uh, Anglo-Saxons, the Germanic tribes, um, and uh, before that, the, uh, uh, the uh, earlier uh, migrations, there's always been a, an east to west migration. An east to west migration, uh, usually, uh, that uh, formed, uh, essentially, that was important in the formation of Europe, were the migrations, one after the other, different groups coming from the north of the Caspian. That is, <clears throat> that is essentially what uh, started giving shape to Europe, such as we know, even from the Homeric times on. I mean, by which I mean the following. Uh, if we look at the uh, one way of reading Homer, of course, uh, the Iliad, is that they're moving to conquer uh, Troy here. Well, who's uh, moving to conquer Troy, well, <clears throat> there is a pressure coming here from uh, there, and then ultimately the, um, the mythological aspect 
you know, the Helen of Troy, the uh, apple that uh, comes in the uh, question, or, or the beauty contest that comes into question in the case of Helen of Troy and so on and so forth. That is the story, sadly. The other thing is that there is a population pressure, and then if we look back, we have much before uh, here and continuously throughout this uh, Middle East and the Anatolian Plateau, you have agricultural economies going back the millennia before, therefore you have a system of deities, gods that relate to fertility, relate to agriculture, uh, and so on and so forth. And then when the Dorians come down here, it's all male gods fighting with one another. And ultimately Greek mythology, just like the uh, occupation and finally the demise of Troy, uh, is the marriage of the fertility-based uh, 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 religions and warlike religions, and thus you get a complete picture of ancient Greek mythology. It is. Well, uh, later on, of course, is the uh, Germanic tribes and of uh, Rome and so on and so forth. Now, much later than those, and much later than the movement of the Germanic tribes, uh, is the uh, migration of southwestern uh, Turkic groups, uh, the forefathers of the Turks in Turkey, the forefathers of the Turks in Azerbaijan. Uh, we know that because of language construction. Uh, it's very sim simple. And then when you look at how Kazakh speak, it is a little further. You don't understand Kazakh speaking, but if they speak very slowly, then you'll start, you know, uh, getting, if you're a native speaker of Turkish, you'll start getting it. But there is really, uh, it is almost the same language di dialect difference uh, for the Anatolian Turks, um, the Azeris, and uh, uh, a bit uh, of the, the, the uh, Turkmen from uh, Turkmenistan. They belong to the same uh, linguistic family and ultimately the distinction is not so much more than um, Scottish and uh, standard Midwestern American. Uh, ultimately you can carry on a pub conversation uh, there. <coughs> now, this movement, uh, let me simplify it, uh, for the purposes of uh, uh, explaining uh, how the Turks came to be an important uh, geopolitical and military factor in the, in the Middle East. When the Turkic uh, groups, uh, these Turkoman groups, started <coughs> out, uh, earlier. Iran, which had, uh, which has had a very long state tradition, uh, Sassanids before Islam, uh, they knew how to run things, uh, and consequently, what they uh, quite wisely for them, uh, did was really facilitate this westward march of the Turks. Uh, sort of, you want to go? Please go. So that they wouldn't stay there. So ultimately, Iranians did not want to deal with these Turks. A few settled here and there. It was not a very crowded world. Uh, but essentially, they came to the area where there was the Abbasid um, uh, Empire. Abbasid Empire, uh, the second one that replaced the Umayyads, 
uh, in 750 with the capital in Baghdad. You have the uh, Abbasid um, Caliph and uh, Abbasids uh, actually shaped Orthodox Islam as it is today, in fact, by, in fact, uh, preventing, <coughs> closing any kind of reinterpretation of Orthodox Islam. So we have inherited this closed world of fundamentalism that only uh, accepts four schools of law from the Abbasids. Now, when these horsemen came from the East, the Abbasids basically uh, said, well, I mean, uh, these people know how to ride horse and how to uh, uh, wage war. Let's integrate them into our army. And in fact, they, uh, they were converted because uh, most of these uh, uh, Turks coming from uh, the um, uh, Western Turkestan area uh, were uh, uh, more or less shamanist, combination of shaman and uh, uh, whatever religions there were. Uh, so they were converted, they became the military arm of the um, Abbasid, uh, Abbasids. Now, the, after a while, the Turks, the military, the commanders, and so on, they said, well, you know, we have the power. Uh, why should we stay in the command of the Abbasid um, uh, Caliph? So, essentially, a process started where the Caliph Caliph's power as the head of state was constrained and ultimately Abbasids went on a uh, decline and uh, then the, uh, uh, the uh, Turkish military command in the Abbasid realms, the entire caliphate, became very important. Who destroyed it. The person who destroyed it was Hulagu. Hulagu was the Mongolic uh, uh, emperor of the steppes. Um, why did Hulagu come and lay waste uh, Baghdad? Again, very simple. Uh, if you look at the tradition, uh, differing tradition of the principles of a nomadic state versus principles of a hierarchical state with a capital. A nomadic state to which I shall return in a little while uh, uh, and only summarize now is first of all is not one that has borders such as we understand. I mean, there are borders and borders. Uh, there are nation state borders we are used to, you know, uh, then there are even reinforced nation state borders, just like the Iron Curtain border here, uh, near, nearby, uh, we all go to the uh, uh, impenetrable border. Uh, but nation-state border is essentially a jurisdiction, and this is our definition, United Nations, it's a jurisdiction. So whether it's small, large, or whatever, in that jurisdiction, the same law applies with the same force to every uh, citizen and every person living within those borders uh, legally. Um, and then there are uh, empires, and empires, particularly land empires, stretch out very, very far. 
and uh, those uh, borders are not as well defined, but they are porous. You can't control particularly uh, historically how people move in and out uh, of these borders. So essentially, um, uh, uh, there is there is incidentally uh, uh, Jan Zielonka's book on Europe as empire, comparing the imperial border notion to enlarging Europe. It's a uh, uh, wonderful theoretical uh, book on porous borders and what happens culturally, porous borders. Now, still there is a concept of borders. And we say the Roman Empire stretched to, uh, uh, all the way to England. Uh, say the Ottomans stretched to uh, Hungarian lowlands here, and so on. But the point is that uh, the Ottoman law, uh, or the Roman law, did not uh, really apply in Gaul as it did in Italy and the immediate neighborhood of uh, Rome, because the system of agriculture, the local system, and so on, are different. So, consequently, the primary objective of an empire is essentially uh, assist production, particularly in the uh, older periods where um, uh, there was agroeconomy and uh, very little commerce as opposed to today you have uh, service economy, production economy, and agroeconomy is very small. But uh, there was nothing uh, until the end of the Middle Ages or middle of the Middle Ages really um, uh, essentially agroeconomy plus trade. So you want to make the peasant be productive. So consequently, you do not apply the same uh, uh, restrictions or encouragement uh, in one geography as you do in another geography. So essentially, there is, uh, as you go away from the center, the taxation systems, laws, and so on and so forth, work more in conformity with local custom in order to make the productive classes, essentially peasants, uh, or better. None of this is uh, true for nomadic empires. Uh, no notion, you have this and here, there is uh, essentially a forest line that would go up that way. Um, and uh, the nomadic uh, hordes, Tatars, would come all the way to the forest line. They didn't like to get into the forest line, but from here across uh, Central Asia, they would essentially um, uh, move, keep on moving. And the center, the command center, is where the tent of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, emperor, nomadic emperor, is. Now, um, the Essentially, it is a, a combination of uh, military tribes, uh, but horseback, as opposed to Germanic tribes moving in, horseback. So they're highly mobile, and uh, the idea is that they do not fight with one another, but go back to Homer, sort of, you know, it's not armies that like trench war trying to kill one another, but essentially two representative heroes come up and it is a sport for them. I mean, sports at that time were real bloody. Uh, and when one of them defeats the other, then that group joins. So it is a process in which 
one group gets larger and larger, so there is, uh, others keep joining it, and this uh, empire grows. Uh, the empire grows, and then supposing the uh, uh, Kagan, or the Khan, had uh, uh, several children. And the idea is that the, the eldest child stays in the center, uh, the uh, second one uh, takes the uh, right uh, uh, side, the eastern side, um, sort of up against the Chinese, and the younger one, the most energetic, is the frontier one to the west. Now, this is an ocean where there is a central military command, and with a passing generation, that military command is, uh, is uh, the center, is the eldest uh, of the, um, of the uh, brothers. So uh, the, the other two have to defer to him. But there is something about frontiers. Uh, if you are in a frontier area, um, and I will repeat a, a part of this so um, uh, this afternoon in the um, in the uh, Eurasian uh, context too, the frontier means that you are constantly uh, at war, and you're also controlling an area where there is. Uh, some sort of a trade, particularly in the West. I mean, when you come to this area, this is a highly concentrated trade area, and then down here, at the end of the uh, silk route, the spice route, and so on and so forth, that has been all uh, there. So, if you're around here, you get um, a much more uh, of a well-trained, uh, you have greater military prowess because you have to fight uh, as a frontiers. And then you also control uh, and tax uh, trade routes. Well, a little bit of trade route in the Gobi Desert, there is nothing moving. I mean, uh, who, who are you going to tax? So you live off the peasants who are here, uh, whether you are a nomad, whether you are Byzantine, whether you are Ottoman, whoever uh, was the normal peasant here uh, producing wheat, they produced it for Constantinople, they produced it for Istanbul, and before that for the, uh, uh, for the Tatar hordes. Ah, the peasant is sitting there, they come and say, give us um, the, the aspect of this is that as the frontier groups, and particularly the Turks who make up the military case and the commanders of the uh, Abbasids, no longer take their orders from the center <laughs> and they infringe on the old nomadic rule. So consequently, they are punished for being unruly by the uh, by Hulago, who lays, uh, back, who lays waste uh, the city of Baghdad. Am I clear on this? That the, the essentially nomadic tradition of rule and hierarchy extends, but you do not move to Baghdad, you know, in two or three days. It might take years, once in a century or once uh, in two centuries. You might remember and say, well, these people are... Uh, getting uppity there, I'll uh, punish them. The upshot of that is 
the <clears throat> is the uh, loss and fragmentation, loss of the center and fragmentation of the um, uh, caliphate uh, around here with many um, many states. One of them is essentially the Seljukid state that inherits Seljukid is really the military commander's uh, state there, which inherits uh, the power of the, um, the army of the caliphate and ultimately they are uh, Turkish speakers and uh, the uh, Seljukids in this um, uh, geography uh, and after the uh, uh, Hulagos uh, laying waste of Baghdad they themselves cannot after a while uh, after a while successfully pushing the Byzantines uh, and, and defeating the uh, Byzantine Emperor in 1071 uh, near around here um, uh, essentially opened the way for uh, Turkish Turkoman tribes to start uh, going and settling in Anatolia. Uh, it's so what was initially a uh, Turkish migration to this area becomes another Turkish migration to uh, Anatolia. And uh, the pattern of this migration, mind you, is not so much different from um, the way in which the Germanic tribes came to this area at the uh, four or five centuries earlier than what I'm describing here. Uh, come here, and uh, the command is some of a election of a leader by acclamation. So they come to some place, uh, 20, 30 kilometers, they walk, and then one of them is uh, Germanic warriors as well. I like this place. There's a lake here, and then there is uh, uh, there are trees, and there is fish, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to uh, stay uh, right here. Uh, it is, mind you, to repeat, uh, it is uh, a very sparsely populated world, so you carve out a place for yourself. Well, as far as uh, the rest of them are, so fine, so we leave uh, Hans here, and then they uh, elect Gernot, and then they move on uh, until another one settles. That is essentially the uh, origin of North European aristocracy. Carve out, settle, you, you are the aristocrat. Aristocrats uh, are landowners, I uh, claim. Um, here, some similar thing, but it is an, a well-organized tribal formation. And that well-organized tribal formation is, first of all, there are the warriors, and then there are the support. They are also organized, the ones who cook, the ones who uh, provide uh, uh, the food, the, uh, the uh, uh, swords, whatever, uh, ironsmiths, and so on and so forth. They are also organized. Um, and uh, uh, and then they have uh, a, a group of uh, heterodox mystics. I mean, they are not orthodox at all. It's a sort of these Tur Turkish tribes at that time are a combination of. Uh, uh, shamanism, other uh, things, 
they pick up uh, some beliefs, local beliefs in Anatolia, and then there is an overall what Islam provides for them is legitimacy. Sort of a glue of legitimacy, nothing else. So they, they are doing this with the mystics, they are doing this uh, uh, conquering and so on and so forth. And incidentally, the women are organized the same way of the tribe. But this is a tribal formation rather than a male military formation like the Germans uh, coming up from north. The Ottomans. It took a while to come back to the Ottomans here. The Ottomans then uh, come, sort of carve out the land for themselves, right there, closer, closest to the Byzantine uh, city of uh, Brusa, uh, which they co will conquer. It, it's, uh, uh, they settle near Nicaea. Uh, then, essentially, they become uh, this frontier state with a frontier spirit. That is essentially the beginning of Ottomans. Um, now, uh, this uh, is to wrap up until here. Uh, it is, uh, you have the um, military tradition of the nomadic uh, past. You have the uh, very loose combination of a heterodox uh, uh, form of uh, what they call Islam, but uh, uh, very much uh, heterodox. So it's, a, it's, a, it's very dynamic. And of course, the tradition really means that the locus of the state is the commander, because it is the commander that issues orders. Uh, so you do not have, essentially, a form of Islamic law but a form of uh, military command as uh, to uh, establish order. Um, again, a small parallel, the importance of this uh, frontier state. And um, after the spread of Christianity because the border uh, keep, kept on going, 9th century, uh, 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, I think most, most by 10th century, uh, even Hamburg was uh, Christian. Uh, then you have this uh, principality of Brandenburg in, uh, as a frontier state of the Germans toward the east, the uh, Teutons, uh, and then uh, the remnants of uh, medieval uh, knights of uh, Lithuania, and so on and so forth. But you have a frontier state there. The result is what? I mean, out of Brandenburg came Prussia. That is so. I mean, th there is there is something about that frontier state which I now having said all of this. Let me uh, uh, summarize up to now two things that what I've said up to now repeats itself. Repeats itself because this Ottomans they uh, conquer. Brusa. Meanwhile, the migration is continuing of these individual groups, uh, groups of uh, tribal organizations, uh, much before the Ottomans as a, uh, as a state moved to conquer the Balkans. Individuals 
continue as they did continue uh, come from the into the core Byzantine lands they go across uh, very early in the uh, uh, 14th century certainly end of 12th century there are all sorts of uh, individual settlements and, and so on and so forth in, in southeastern uh, Europe uh, but also, in, in parallel, the state is, is um, consolidating here, and uh, then the armies actually come and also take Adrianople. So you have the Ottomans, basically, um, early on, have two capitals, east and west, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, they have uh, essentially uh, the uh, uh, a, a uh, uh, military uh, surrounding the uh, capital city Constantinople much before actually uh, the conquest of Constantinople but they have that in mind they have that in mind uh, they have that in mind early on in um, <coughs> 1390s, end of 1390s, a uh, castle is built here by uh, Bayezid to attack uh, Constantinople. But just like Hulagu, then Tamerlane moves on to Anatolia to punish Bayezid because he's consolidating a state rather than deferring to the nomadic chief here. So the, Ottoman, the Ottomans are defeated very badly and uh, uh, Temelin takes, I mean Temelin was fairly ruthless, he uh, had a um, pyramid of uh, skulls uh, near uh, Izmir made when he attacked the fortress there um, and he put uh, uh, Bayezid into a cage to demonstrate uh, and joke in his court and so on and so forth. That was the punishment levied on the, on the Ottomans. It took a while to uh, actually, uh, for uh, the uh, interregnum that followed, uh, uh, to get over that and then reconsolidate uh, the empire. And then, uh, in the middle of the uh, 15th century, uh, 1453, uh, Turks conquered uh, Byzantium. Now, uh, conquered Constantinople. Now, from Bayezid on to Mehmed II, who, who conquered it, and then Suleiman, the consolidation of the Ottoman Empire also meant uh, a reorganization of the hierarchy. The spirit of the frontier, heterodoxy, and sort of loose kind of, uh, when you have an empire, you need to you know, tighten things up. So actually, uh, the frontier spirit, along with heterodoxy, started giving uh, way to uh, well-knit institutions. Uh, but what were these institutions supposed to do? Um, well, and what was in the mind uh, identity of, um, of uh, the conquering uh, Ottomans, uh, particularly getting, uh, aiming to get Byzantium? Well, this is uh, an important part. From early on, from at least from Bayezid, we know uh, from the records, to 
uh, Mehmet II, certainly. They called this area Diare Ru, Roman lands. And they thought that they were the heirs to um, Eastern Roman Empire. So consequently, the conquest of Constantinople was not imagined by Mehmet II as a way to get the, the Christians out of there, so much as continue the Roman Empire with a better military and uh, command uh, mechanism. They certainly, otherwise, I mean, uh, the, the change was extraordinary in the sense that the first thing uh, after the, uh, the conquest, uh, what did uh, Mehmet II do? He brought in Bellini to paint his picture uh, as the emperor. Right. So the Ottomans moving into this area were essentially to um, or at least it was paralleled by the uh, Ottoman uh, elite identity of being the heirs to the Roman Empire. Now, um, then why continued um, uh, move to Central Europe, and why there was in the end of the uh, uh, 1480s or so a move towards coming to Otranto here with the, the idea of conquering um, conquering uh, Rome. Well, two things that we must bear in mind there. Uh, one is that the early on as designed by Mehmet II, he died in 1480 and this was planned just before his death and uh, 8081 Turks were there in Otranto. That is exactly what the Byzantines would do to hold on to territory here to threaten the papal ter territories. It was no different from that. Byzantines were here a long time and uh, 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 just uh, the, it wasn't a split between really uh, Eastern Church and the Western Church, but Constantine basically moved to create the real city of God there in, in Constantinople, because Rome, according to him, was bound to uh, disintegrate in corruption and lack of direction and lack of uh, morality and so on and so forth. And by establishing this as Eastern Rome, he never said this was Eastern Rome. He said, this is the real Rome. That is just finished, gone. Uh, it has no future. One. Number two, he did something which I think was one of the main uh, one of the main factors that reinforced the differentiation between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, uh, Orthodox Europe um, and, and um, Catholic Europe. I'm saying this not because uh, Orthodoxy is so different and so on and so forth. It's essentially what he established here is a very different relationship between the state and religion. 
I mean, this one is, uh, you have uh, the emperor and you have the pope. And the, there is interdependence and also one checks the power of the other. Because the emperor is not under the pope. The pope can only decide whether the emperor is a good Christian or not. But the pope cannot overrule the divine right of kings. That is, the emperor has the divine right of kings. So the emperor can only constrain the, uh, the pope can only constrain the emperor politically by putting a chip on his shoulder saying this emperor is not a, uh, is not a good um, uh, emperor, is not a good Christian, because how are emperors emperors? Emperors are elected by acclamation. It's the good old Germanic system. There are plenty up here, both uh, uh, bishops of cities and uh, uh, particularly landowning aristocracy who want to become emperors. So by saying this guy has a chip on his shoulder, they'll be able to get more votes. The voting was never split between churchmen and aristocrats. It was local politics or regional politics that determined who the emperor was going to be. So the split didn't go that way. The split went according to regional interests and political interests. So that is the way the emperor, uh, that's the way that the emperor was constrained by Pope. But uh, the, uh, the Pope was constrained uh, quid pro quo by the fact that he could not order the emperor, um, uh, he could not demote the emperor, he could only uh, restrict the emperor that way. This, I think, uh, has implications as to how uh, Western European uh, state and contractual relationship, uh, later social contract and so on and so forth, developed. This, I think, is a very important aspect. Uh, but this notion did not spread here because Constantine essentially made the state responsible and protector of religion. When you make the state the protector of religion, you are also putting religion under the wing of the state. So ironically, if you are the protector of religion, you also, for political reasons, have the state power to constrain religion. So essentially, the system of state and religion being intertwined was not different from the relationship established early on by the Abbasids and later by the Ottomans, uh, that the state and religion are also intermixed, but uh, the state, raison d'etat, has priority in the classical period over uh, religious uh, decisions. Um, or the religious caste. 